I've been accused of being a robot before. No, really, I have. But if that's true, was this video created by AI? Obviously not, because robotics and AI aren't the same thing. Okay, but before I get started, the thumbnail is clickbait. I'm not gonna make a super academic video. I tried and it just felt exhausting. <laughs> so that's my disclaimer. This is me just speaking off the cuff without a script. No, oh, that sounds weird. Maybe this is just me completely unscripted. This is just me completely unscripted, just speaking off the cuff. If you write software for a living, then you've probably heard time and time again not to use microservices and that we should all just use monoliths. And I seem to see this warning all the time. So why then are microservices so proliferated? And personally, I've never worked for an organization or at a company that has not used microservices sorry, quote unquote, microservices in some form or fashion. And I say microservices with air quotes, because from my experience, most people don't really seem to know what microservices really are. And I feel like that's kind of why this is hard for me to talk about, because it's one of those things where the more I learn about it, the more I realize I just don't understand anything. And microservices is a complex topic, but it can also be a very nuanced topic. But microservices, or the microservice architecture, it mainly solves a particular problem. And that problem is specifically around scalability, where that scalability kind of has two dimensions, one of which is just like scalability of infrastructure or services, but also scalability of teams and large sprawling organizations. But just from my experiences and my perception of why teams choose to adopt a microservices architecture, is not to solve those specific problems. It's to uh, decompose applications or products into independently deployable units of code. It has nothing to do with tackling specific challenges that microservices help us to solve. But microservices increase complexity. But why and how? Well, I'll get into that, but they do. But if the only reason a team chooses a microservices architecture is to create those independently deployable units of code, then additional complexity is introduced into the system essentially for no good reason. But if teams tend to choose microservices for the wrong reason, then what are the right reasons? Why are microservices so hard and how do things go so wrong? Well, I'm going to state some strong opinions I have on the internet Ooh. by making a couple assertions about what I think microservices mean or maybe just common misconceptions or I, I don't know, but here I go. So my first assertion, and of course, as a developer, I would choose to use the word assertion here, but if your system doesn't treat events as first class citizens, then you don't really have a microservices architecture. And how did I come to this conclusion? Well, I kind of touched on this before, but microservices are used to solve fairly specific optimization problems around scalability in distributed systems. And one of the most effective ways to do this is through message passing. But this idea of treating events as first-class citizens in a system is poorly understood by most developers. And when events are used, it's usually a pretty naive implementation. But most of the time, teams don't have these things at the forefront of their minds when choosing to adopt a microservices architecture. Interject this at the most optimal time in the video. If you're finding this content helpful, then hit the like button and consider subscribing because it's free and it helps me feel better about myself. Okay, so events are important, but why? This leads into my second assertion, which is a key characteristic of a microservices architecture is that each service has its own database. But rather than just blindly accepting that as fact, which, which it is, you kind of have to ask yourself, but why? And I guess you don't have to ask yourself. I, if you're someone like me, then you have to ask, you have to know. So yeah, there's kind of like two parts to this. There's one part where you have encapsulation and separation of concerns. I manage my data and you manage yours. But remember, microservices solve a specific optimization problem. So the separation isn't just about logically separating databases, but it's also about physically separating infrastructure. If I have two services that both use MongoDB, each with their own database, but sharing the same cluster, and one service experiences a huge spike in traffic, then that could affect the availability of the other service while you wait for your infrastructure to scale up. If this is your architecture, do you really have microservices? because you just defeated one of the primary reasons for using microservices. How do things go wrong with this? In my experience, one of two things happen. Either you end up having two services share the same database, or the other way that this can go wrong is you have one service relying completely on another service for key pieces of data. 
Let's take the classic online retailer example where you have an order service and a product service and like an inventory service. Most of your stuff is going to revolve around products. And so the order service and the inventory service are both going to need to grab information out of the product service. But most people's intuition leads them to think that, oh, I have the product service, and so the product service should own all of the data about products, which makes sense. But then this creates a fallacy where all of the data about products must exist in the product service, and they can't exist anywhere else. And if they do, it's just things like IDs and basic info like titles or descriptions and you know, stuff like that. And so there's this great hesitance to share data between different services and allow key pieces of data to exist separately from each other in different services. And this hesitancy is not completely unfounded. It's because we desire strong consistency in our systems because strong consistency is easier to work with. But people don't want to deal with eventually consistent data. So typically what ends up happening is you have a bunch of services that end up communicating with each other primarily over synchronous blocking REST API calls. Or maybe you can sprinkle in some gRPC in there or something. But regardless, that approach is terrible for scalability. And this leads to assertion number three, which is cross-cutting concerns between services is what makes microservices so difficult. And this pretty much always boils down to sharing data. And I guess this is kind of like an assertion 3A, which is you should not be afraid to allow data, data, is it data or data? Data to exist in multiple places at the same time because that's really the basis for how you get the performance and scalability that is promised by using the microservices architecture. If the order service is allowed to persist data that specifically has to do with products and is managed by products, then it doesn't have to communicate over a network in order to get information that it needs about the products. And by doing so, that can increase the performance of the order service by an order of magnitude. But sharing data introduces a pretty big trade-off. Have I mentioned CAP theorem? Should I mention CAP theorem? CAP theorem, where the CAP stands for Consistency, Availability, and Partition Tolerance. Intolerance? Partition Tolerance. It shows how well I know this stuff. But between those three, the CAP theorem says that you can only pick two. And since most of us are sane individuals and we want our services to actually work, we choose to have the partition intolerance, or in other words, we can communicate reliably across a network. And so that leaves consistency and availability. And you can choose to have strong consistency, which is less performant, but reduces complexity. Or you can choose eventual consistency, which offers better performance, but comes at the cost of increased complexity. And on a note with strong consistency, in a monolith, this is less of an issue because you typically have direct access to the database and you don't need to communicate across a network with other services to get the data that you need. And if you do need to communicate across a network to access the data that you need in your database, which is most likely, I guess you, you could have a database living on the same hardware as your service. And just like Yoda says that fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. Well, in a microservices architecture, microservices lead to cross-cutting concerns, which leads to data sharing, which leads to dealing with the trade-off of strong versus eventual consistency, which leads to either a significant decrease in performance or a significant increase of complexity, and sometimes both. Oh, and it also leads to suffering. Okay, so assertion number four. I don't know how well of a job I've done at explaining all these things. Of course, this is gonna be edited, but my thoughts have been scattered like crazy so who knows if i've made a string of coherent thoughts or not i won't until i edit this and put it together but fourth assertion you should start with a monolith but why that's the question i feel like is never answered people tell you to start with a monolith but never say why you should start with a monolith so from my perspective here's why a monolith is the quickest and easiest way to finding the hidden and unforeseen complexity that lives in every single business if you do start with a microservices architecture I 100% guarantee you will run into issues that would have been far easier to address, modify, fix than if you had just started with a monolith in the first place. I will reiterate that microservices are an optimization. I used to think that a microservice architecture was just a choice, something that you decided upfront. If you follow the common wisdom of first make it work, then make it better, then optimize it, then starting with a the monolith is the first logical step. 
And if you're going to stubbornly choose to use microservices anyway, like me, then at least start with a microlith. A microlith sounds kind of tongue in cheek. I think the first time I heard it, it was tongue in cheek, but a microlith is just like a monolithic application that exists as like some kind of service in a microservices architecture. I guess start with something big until you figure out all the different edge cases and the areas that you need to optimize and then go for a microservices architecture. And by doing it this way, you still get the warm and fuzzy feeling of knowing that you have your piece of application code that you can deploy independently of anyone else, but you'll hopefully be less likely to make some terrible mistake that is pretty easy to do when you actually do a microservices architecture. And I guess lastly, there's my fifth assertion, which is microservices have value. Microservices can be really good. Sure, they introduce complexity, but they also provide a really good solution to certain problems that you just can't accomplish with a monolith. I would just first figure out your business, but yeah, microservices are fine. Just be intentional about it so you don't end up with a complex system without the true benefits of a microservices architecture. Yeah, that's it. That's all I got.